Thank you to everyone for, thank you for joining the National Coalition for, for Food and Agricultural Research, NCFAR, for today's Latte and Learn webinar featuring USDA Research, Education, and Economics, REE, leaders. NCFAR is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, consensus-based, and consumer-led coalition that brings together food, agriculture, nutrition, conservation, and natural resource stakeholders to serve as a forum and unified voice supporting increased federal investment in USDA's entire REE portfolio. I'm Janae Brady, Senior Director of Government Affairs with the American Seed Trade Association, who is a proud member of NCFAR. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which features Administrator Hamer from USDA's National Agricultural Stat Statistics Service, NAS, and Administrator Stefano from USDA's Economic Research Service. A little bit of background to start, Administrator Hubert Hamer has served as NAS Administrator since 2016. He brings extensive experience in all aspects of the agency's work. Before becoming Administrator, he served as Director of the Statistics Division, as well as Executive Director of the NAS Agricultural Statistics Board and Executive Director of the Advisory Committee on Agriculture Statistics. Prior to these roles, Administrator Hamer also served as Associate Deputy Administrator for Field Operations, overseeing 24 state field offices, as well as the Training and Career Development Office. It would probably be easier to list the roles at NAS that he hasn't held rather than, than those that he has. Hamer was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in 2000, and he completed the program for Senior Managers in Government at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government in 2004. Prior to this, he completed the Office of Personnel Management OPM Executive Potential Program, through which he served as a fellow for the Senate Budget Committee and worked on the staff of Secretary of Agriculture. Administrator Hamer was born on a small livestock and row crop farm in Benton County, Mississippi, and later continued his development in Grand Junction, Tennessee. He's a graduate of Tennessee State University. Thank you for joining us today, Administrator Hamer. Administrator Spiro Stefano has served as the Administrator of the Economic Research Service since 2000, sorry, 2020. He provides leadership and guidance for the agency research, analytical, and technical operations. Since 2015, Dr. Stefano was a Professor of Economics in the Food and Resource Economics Department at the University of Florida. Prior to his time in Florida, Dr. Stefano was Professor of Agricultural Economics at Penn State University since 1983. Dr. Stefano received his PhD in Agricultural Economics from the University of California, Davis, his MS in Agricultural and Resource Economics from the University of Maryland, and a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from George Washington University. Dr. Stefano's research activities address themes of competitiveness and growth and related policy implications. His resume includes an extensive list of global honors and achievements, including his appointment as a Distinguished Fellow of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. Thank you for participating today, Administrator Stefano. Today's webinar highlights the importance of NCFAR support for USDA Research, Education, and Economics mission area. REE underlies the tools necessary to build resiliency for humanity's most basic needs, particularly relating to climate change and nutrition security for all Americans. The roles of NAS and ERS are critical in that effort. Audience participation is welcome. Please type any questions you may have throughout the webinar in the chat box as we'll address audience questions at the end of today's session. I'd like to turn it over to the panel to provide an overview of the mission of their agencies and to make any opening remarks. Administrator Hamer, let's, let's start with you. The audience might have varying levels of experience with NAS. So can you start out by providing an overview of, of the NAS mission area? Sure, thank you, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As you know, uh, NAS, the National Agricultural Statistics Service is USDA's statistical arm. Uh, in that capacity, uh, our mission is to provide timely, accurate, and useful statistics uh, in service to US agriculture. We measure all aspects of US uh, agriculture uh, production. And, and in general terms, uh, disseminate about 450 reports uh, on an annual basis covering crops, livestock, economic, and environmental statistics. In addition to that, uh, we also uh, complete the Census of Agriculture on, on a five-year basis. Uh, the next Census of Agriculture we're working on is for 2022. Uh, the Census has the most comprehensive set of information for and about U.S. agriculture with data down to uh, more than 3,000 counties, 
parishes and boroughs across the United States. Uh, the individuals, we have a very uh, strong workforce. All of our individuals in the organization are career civil servants. As you know, a number of the reports that we release contain market sensitive information. All of that information is uh, protected and disseminated uh, within, within, within NAS without any interaction uh, from any politicals or anyone outside uh, the organization. Uh, so in general terms, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we provide this service and, and uh, that's kind of uh, the scope, the general scope of, of what we do. And we can talk more specifics uh, as we move into the uh, Q&A and other uh, uh, program uh, discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Stefano, I'll turn it to you to give an overview of ERS. Well, our, the Economic Research Service is, has a mission to inform and enhance public and private decision-making. And we do that by anticipating emerging issues as well as conducting sound and peer-reviewed economic research and analysis on policy relevant issues, focusing on agriculture, food, the environment, and rural America. You know, we're not making policy recommendations, we're engaged in policy informing activities. Uh, we have, I like to characterize us, ourselves as having three core assets. We have our human capital, or the expertise embodied in our, our staff. We have data and we have models that we use. And we leverage those three to create the economic intelligence that we, we offer to the public and to policymakers. Uh, so th those are the, the core themes of what we do. About half of our staff hold PhDs, another 25% hold master's degrees. So we have a fairly uh, expert staff on board. We are not, we're, we're the smallest in terms of number of employees and, uh, and, and budget within REE, but we are mighty. Uh, we have a, we think we can have a pretty big impact. And you know, we focus on asking the relevant questions. We tend to be timely with our objective economic analysis and research and uh, we look to add value in, in those ways. So happy to answer your questions going forward. Thank you so much. As a reminder, uh, if the audience members have any questions, please do type them into the into the chat. But I have a I have a list of, of areas that I'm certainly interested to hear a little bit more about. Um, so to start, you mentioned uh, ERS's role on emerging issues. So I think it's a good place to um, sort of level set. I'd be curious to hear from both of you. Um, and we can start with you, Dr. Stefano, but um, what are some of your key accomplishments from the last year, maybe even the last two years, because I know it's been a, a challenging couple of years that have been lumped together. Um, so what are your key accomplishments? And, and with those accomplishments, um, what are the areas of focus? What are some of those emerging issues that you see in the up Thanks for that question. Uh, so as you know, we've been on hiring spree, uh, kind of from a logistical point of view, we've hired quite a few staff. We went from about just under 100 staff at the beginning of October 2019. We are well over 270 right now. Most of those staff were hired during the pandemic. Most of them, we have staff distributed all over the country, 36 different states. Uh, so onboarding you know, 80 to 90 folks a year and mentoring them and getting them in place during a pandemic, that's quite a challenge. Uh, and I think we, we've measured up quite nicely. Throughout all of this, our productivity has been very strong. We've provided over 500 staff analyses and briefings for USDA and other government officials. And the idea of these briefings is to provide key insights in forming major policy decisions, such as changes to the Thrifty Food Plan, uh, better understanding of tax provisions and the American Families Plan. Uh, uh, those, re those are uh, reports that the activities we put out in a fairly timely way add value to the discussion at present. Uh, in the last fiscal year, we, we published over 150 reports. Uh, we published uh, almost 115 journal articles in leading applied economics journals. So we, we've, 
we've been able to maintain really strong productivity. Uh, and you know, we, we are, we're a different, a different setup, right? We, we can do a lot of our work in this environment, uh, you know, this distributed environment pretty, pretty easily. We don't have water, plants to water, animals to feed, folks to interview. Um, so we, we've managed to do quite, quite well. Our priorities right now are to be supporting the administration of uh, objectives, initiatives, focusing on climate change and agriculture, nutritional and security, open and fair, uh, open and competitive markets, fair markets, as well as racial social equity and promoting growth in rural America. So uh, we, we take those, that agenda very seriously and we're investing in that as well as our core activities. Thank you, Administrator Hamer. Uh, comments on your key accomplishments and, and what you're looking towards in the future? Yeah, <clears throat> and first I, I wanted to say one other thing about our staff resources. We have about 850 full-time federal employees and that staff is augmented with about 3,000 contract employees that help us with our data collection activities, whether making phone calls from, a, from the phone banks or actually uh, physically knocking on doors. Obviously, some of that has been interrupted with the pandemic as far as uh, on, on the ground data collection activity. And our organization is uh, obviously uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we're supported uh, with 12 regional offices and 33 satellite offices across the country to ensure that we have uh, customer service at the local level to work with the universities, the ag groups, the departments of agriculture and constituents on the ground. So I wanted to say that uh, we've had a very productive uh, 2023 uh, year, a lot of accomplishments. I mentioned the about 450 uh, 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 annual reports that we disseminate. Uh, in addition uh, to that, uh, we're very proud that we were able to launch uh, two additional uh, new geospatial decision support tools. Uh, we released on uh, February 17th, the first ever hemp acreage and production uh, survey results uh, with acreage production, the value of production, et cetera. In that report, we're currently uh, 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 I want to say a little bit more about those geospatial uh, products, a crop condition and soil moisture analytical tool that provides soil moisture and important data for uh, crop planting, yield forecasting and weather monitoring. And additionally, a crop cross web-based interactive query uh, mapping tool uh, that works very well with our well-established cropland data layer program. In addition to that, we've worked very closely uh, to implement a new, very user-friendly uh, collection tool uh, to make it easier for farmers and ranchers to go online and provide information to us. We wanna make sure that that is as efficient uh, and modern as possible. And we are also working uh, to communicate more effectively with producers. Uh, using more email and text uh, reminders uh, to let them know to anticipate that we have collection instruments on the way. And then another exciting uh, example of a new innovative product, an integrated modeling and geospatial estimation system, where we're able to pull multiple sources of information together from geospatial and sensor data, uh, administrative data, survey data, and we've uh, identified and developed a cloud-based analytical platform to process data. So we're very, very excited about the outlook for that. Uh, some of the goals, uh, some of the major activities moving forward uh, this year. Uh, number one, uh, we're in the throes of pre preparing for the 2022 Census of Agriculture, uh, making sure that we have all of the uh, uh, systems tested, the list development process is, in, is underway. Uh, all of our collection tools, we're working on those because uh, the data collection will actually start in late November, early uh, December of this year. Uh, so we're looking at a major, uh, the biggest, our flagship data collection activities over the ne next uh, eight or nine, 10 months. 
along with the analysis with the uh, reports to be released, the results to be released in February of 2024. So a lot of things on our plate, in addition to the items that uh, uh, Spiro mentioned about uh, supporting uh, climate change within the uh, within a department, racial equity, uh, nutrition. Uh, those are all top priorities for the organization. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to um, getting a little deeper into some of those those particular priorities with nutrition and uh, climate change. But I wanted to take a, a minute, since we have um, quite a few congressional staffers on the line, to talk about your relationship with with Congress and with congressional staff in particular, uh, you have a lot of resources available to you. So how does Congress and, and congressional staff, I, I noted uh, that you said that you don't provide policy recommendations, but you uh, inform policy. So if you both could talk a little bit about how you inform Congress, how, uh, how does Congress's policy decisions um, come from the information that, that you all provide. And similarly, on the other vein, since there are folks on the line who um, have uh, a little bit of say and um, control over the legislation that comes down the line, how what role does Congress play in the issue and content and priorities that, that you all and your agencies are studying? Um, let's start with Dr. Stefano. Great, uh, well, we, prioritize our research activities uh, by communicating with lots of different stakeholders, including Congress. Right? We, we get uh, initiatives uh, from Congress, directives to look at some look at specific issues. Uh, for example, we just released three reports uh, in the last you know, few months. One's on land access, another was, uh, there's a healthcare report that's out now. Um, we did a report on retaliatory tariffs, their impact on agriculture. Uh, so those were themes that, those are products that came directly from Congress wanting to have some, some answers to those questions. Uh, so that, that is something that we, we take very seriously, of course, and we, we address. Uh, we also get uh, customers and stakeholders and partners from other parts of the system that come to us. The secretary, other mission areas, for example, we work closely with across mission areas, probably almost all the other mission areas. Uh, FNS, for example, with nutrition related food access issues, rural development uh, on broadband. Uh, we also work with folks outside the agency, outside the department. Uh, we did a, a nice uh, piece of work on food insecurity among veterans for the Veterans Administration. And DOD picked up on that and we're doing some work for them on um, military families and food security. So we, we tried to add value across, you know, across the whole government. And, uh, and certainly we, we provide lots of briefings to, to, the, uh, to the congressional side. Anything to add, Administrator Hamer? Yeah, thank you. And uh, obviously, uh, Congress is a major stakeholder uh, for us. Uh, we work very closely with staff members. Uh, obviously, they provide the appropriations, the resources for us uh, to conduct the work that we do. Um, many times, they're very descriptive, sometimes in language, that they are very interested in specific topics, that they want to ensure that these reports are continued. Uh, we obviously listen to that feedback. We provide the data. Uh, the, the congressional staffers in Congress, they're tremendous data users. And uh, obviously, we have the non-biased uh, information and, and data uh, uh, supporting agriculture, evidence building, decision making. Uh, and uh, so we're part of that process. And uh, I want to ensure that they get uh, the type of information they need uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, provide policy support uh, and legislation uh, in support of the ag community. Thank you. And, and Dr. Stefano, you, you uh, answered part of my next question already um, in your previous question. Um, so you read my mind a little bit, but um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the grand finale of a, a three-part um, series, Latte and Learn, where uh, the audience was able to hear from 
NIFA from ARS and then rounding it out with you all. So um, I wanted to ask about how you all work with these other agencies, how other, other mission areas use your, your data, which you did a great job of, of already um, discussing. And I'd like to also hear, because I know that, um, as you mentioned, uh, your information is really critical across the federal government. So you gave a couple of great examples with the, uh, the Veterans Affairs and, and things like that. I know EPA and others uh, rely on, on your information as well. So um, would love for you both to expand on, on how you work um, across the federal agencies as well. Um, Administrator Hamer, let's go to, with you. Yeah, thank you. And obviously within the mission area, we work seamlessly together closely. Uh, our programs are supportive of each other's and uh, complementary. Uh, we uh, are able to leverage resources and staff and, and all of those things within the mission area. A couple of other examples of how some of our data have been used uh, fairly recently. Uh, an example I'll use is the Centers for Disease uh, Prevention use census of agriculture data uh, to uh, identify where farm workers were uh, to provide vaccine support uh, to them. That's something that uh, you generally wouldn't think, wouldn't think about uh, our data uh, for the census, obviously, uh, we have comprehensive information down to every county uh, within the United States, more than 3,000 counties, parishes, and boroughs. That information is used to support uh, research around uh, climate change, uh, to provide uh, statistical information on uh, what's available in terms of production uh, to support nutrition and those types of areas. So uh, any... Uh, particular area around uh, U.S. agriculture, uh, in general terms, we will have some information that will be helpful uh, to uh, decision makers. And I'll add, uh, NAS and ERS are two of 13 principal statistical agencies of the U.S. federal government. That is an incredibly high bar for us clear and we take that challenge seriously and great pride so we we work with the other agencies uh, as, as Hubert mentioned with census for example we there is something called the pulse survey that the U.S. census put out as a with the onset of the pandemic what's going on right now we can't wait to learn what happened two years after the event and so is frequent pulsing, short, quick surveys and ERS participated in that with a set of food, food security related questions to try to keep track of what's going on. We, we work closely in particular with NAS on a lot of our surveys, the uh, ARMS data, the Agricultural Resource Management Survey, 30,000 plus farms surveyed on a number of issues. We work closely with ARS in terms of translating their, their production science expertise and then adding value to the economic side. Uh, so we, we are very closely aligned with them. You know, we're kind of, we're like siblings, you know, not like in-laws, you know, where with in-laws you just kind of talk about things that you want to argue about, you know, like recipes or something. Uh, we, we work very closely. Uh, these other agencies, you know, we try to really add a lot of value. NAS and ERS are intimately involved with the, the data system, the statistical system in the U.S. government. Uh, the second biggest part of my budget after people are data and data investments. You know, we, we are data-driven, evidence-building agencies. That's how we try to add value to policy. And I, I will piggyback on, on Spiro as far as the, in terms of use of resources within NAS, uh, the two line items that represent the bulk of our, our budget are staff resources and data collection costs. Uh, so uh, the issue that we have is an insatiable appetite for more and new information and data. And uh, we have an established program uh, to uh, that uh, the data users are, are waiting for that information. Uh, those reports that I mentioned, they're all pre-scheduled. There's a calendar uh, out there a year in advance that really shows what's coming. Uh, and uh, so they know the date, the time uh, that information will be available that affects their specific uh, uh, industry. 
Thanks. And I have to imagine as, as our technologies advance and our need for, for data increases that those lines are only going to continue to, to grow and the need for them will only continue to grow. So really helpful background. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the role that you all play with producers in particular. Um, you've talked quite a bit about the census of agriculture. I know most every farmer producer across the country knows exactly what that, what that census is and, and, and relies upon it. Um, and you also mentioned, um, I think with, with Mass in particular, um, the presence regionally across, across the country. I mean, we have an incredibly diverse agricultural system. Um, so I would love it if both of you could talk a little bit about the role that ERS and NAS play for our producers in particular, whether that's with planting decisions and, and how you all are able to balance such a, such a um, regionally diverse um, industry. Well, uh, I'll say I'll say a few things uh, about it. Uh, obviously, uh, the the farming and, and ranching community they are a prolific data users as well. Uh, we work very closely with the uh, producer associations, uh, providing information and data, uh, and we also uh, work closely with them uh, because sometimes uh, we're always concerned about quality of data response rates, ensuring that the producers are on board with the surveys. So we work very closely with them because they're the, uh, the users of much of that information uh, to uh, have a partnership where they will uh, talk with their producers. They will help us with promotional activities to ensure that we're getting a representative sample of those uh, producers providing information uh, back to us. In addition to those producer organizations that uh, uh, infrastructure allows us to work very closely with the land grant colleges and universities, not only for recruiting, but data use uh, purposes, the extension uh, specialists use our information to educate on the ground out there. And uh, again, we work very closely with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, the commissioners, secretaries and directors of agriculture. And uh, we provide statistical support and services for those departments such that we don't have statisticians working for the state departments of agriculture and the same resources being used at the federal level. So uh, we'll augment our survey program with their data needs on a cost reimbursable basis. So ERS, we focus uh, nationally on issues related to agriculture. We won't look at you know, what's going on in dairy in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, but we do a lot of work on, a lot of outlook work on commodities. Um, we have uh, a, a fairly large substantial staff on, in terms of crops and livestock outlook. Uh, we put out a grain and oil seeds outlook report, sugar outlook, feed grain outlook, livestock outlook, all the other commodities. And so those are regularly updated reports to kind of provide you what's the current situation and what's what's the what are the future prospects in the immediate uh, in the immediate future. The other thing I'd like to emphasize is the and Hubert touched on this, you know, it's the data providers, you know, those folks who are on the ground giving us their information. Okay? They are critical to this whole process. Uh, even when you see food insecurity work that comes out from from uh, ERS. That's data coming from states and communities. And it's aggregated up. And sometimes, you know, maybe the part of the federal system thinks that, well, now we own the data, but it came from, from the ground. And we're very mindful and respectful of that. And trying to, to use these, these data in the way that we said that we'd use them. And so folks have to trust us that we're going to protect their the confidentiality of their information. We don't let anyone just kind of look at these data. You know, we, we do the analysis and folks on the other end who use our analysis have to trust us that we did it in a, in a high fidelity manner. And so trust is like the key to putting out data that has value and, uh, and maintaining the integrity of this whole system and how we do business. So that's, that's an important feature in how we, we do our work. It's, it's just not a lot of grinding and calculating and pumping out the numbers. You know, there, there are relationships here that we are mindful of every day. 
And, and Spiro, I will add that the, the data that's provided by individual producers, it's not only protected by a pledge, it's supported and protected by law with fines and prison time associated with that. So we take confidentiality and uh, the integrity of the, the, those data products very, very seriously. So I love that both of you could expand a little bit on, uh, you know, obviously this is a, a service that is provided to producers and to the U.S. agriculture industry, um, but it's clearly something that is important for all Americans. And, and you both talked about um, some of the administration priorities as it relates to uh, nutrition and, and climate change. And um, would love if you could just talk a little bit about how you take what you're doing for producers and, and, and expand that and make sure that you're um, sort of serving all of the people of, of the United States. Well, I, I'll start with uh, when you talk about all of the producers, uh, every five years, I, I, I've mentioned the census of agriculture where we build a list frame uh, the, of anyone that has a product, a production of $1,000 of more of agricultural uh, sales or potential sales. Uh, so uh, if you look at the vast majority of farms across the United States, they're, very, they're small farms. Uh, more than half of the farms have less than $10,000 in ag sales. What we find now is not only are individuals and data users interested in the raw production of, of, of commodities, but they're interested in who is providing that, the demographic characteristics of the American farmer. What are the contributions of women? What are the contributions of veterans? Uh, what are the racial makeup and, and, and of, of, of these uh, particular operations out there? So the census really provides that down to the county level uh, where you're able to really slice and dice and split and, and just find out again, what are the contributions of these individuals? Uh, so we're collecting more and more information about the producer. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, that, that's what the census really provides. You know, and for us, I'll give a very short answer. You know, this is about providing evidence and data-based policy decision-making information. Uh, and that's, that's the key. And that's the value we can add to, to the whole system and all the, all the stakeholders involved in the system. And let them make the decision. Our, our, and from an ERS perspective, you know, as well as NASC, you know, we're policy informing. Let's give you the best information, the best perspectives that we can. You don't want economists making economic policy, just like you don't want nuclear scientists making nuclear policy. A lot more folks, a lot more voices need to be at the table. We're just trying to offer offer the best intelligence we can to make those decisions. All right, thank you. Um, Administrator Hamer, I know that you have a great deal of experience with the NAS process known as, as lockup. And I know you talked a little bit about some of the sensitivities of, of the data that you deal with. And um, I'd be curious for you to share just a, a little bit about the, the purpose and the process of the lockup um, system in particular, um, as well as I'd be curious as how the last few years of the global pandemic has, has impacted that. Yeah, uh, basically the, the lockup process started uh, in 1905 after a scandal uh, where actually there was some uh, data leaked. Uh, cotton was the most important commodity at that time. And at that time, when you were working on those, on those sensitive market, market sensitive reports, uh, staff were able to go out, have lunch, uh, go about their regular business until this occurred. So as a result of that, and I won't get into exactly what happened, but as a result of that, uh, basically, what lockup is, is a full physical perimeter around the workspace when these principal federal economic indicator reports are being worked on, uh, where staff typically will go into what's called a lockup situation about anywhere between midnight and 4 a.m. in the morning and stay within those physical walls without connectivity to the outside world. No internet, no phone, no uh, no lunch breaks outside. You bring whatever you need uh, within those uh, perimeters, uh, and then we have security around that until those reports are released currently at noon uh, on, on the uh, specified day. Uh, it was all about protecting uh, the integrity of the information, ensuring 
that if someone had that information early, uh, they could take a position in the market. And if you know what's going to happen before it happens, it could be quite lucrative. But all of those transactions are, are, are uh, monitored. And uh, we have not had a breach in security since we instituted those, uh, those uh, security measures. Thanks. There's a lot that, that goes into your roles that I think uh, the average, uh, certainly Hill staffer or uh, um, person just doesn't, doesn't think about. So, But um, when you think about it, you go in through security similar to going through the airport. Uh, the staff, anyone working on those reports has to uh, uh, adhere to those protocols. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Dr. Stefano, you joined USDA after spending um, your career working in the academic environment. So I'd be curious if you um, could share just if, what your experience has been in this new role. Is there anything that has surprised you, anything that you wished you had known before you began government service? Uh, well, not I wish I had known. Um, I had worked with ERS since I started a, on faculty at, at uh, Penn State. Uh, I, so I had, a, I had lots of, lots of uh, friends and colleagues there. Uh, and so coming in, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what ERS does and how they're set up. And, you know, I probably knew about 25%, right? There's a lot, a lot going on. Uh, and so uh, the biggest difference is that what we do at ERS is demand-driven. You know, what is the need? What are the relevant questions that we need to address? Uh, we are not a research institution like a university where you have a lot of individual folks promoting their own agendas. Everyone at ERS knows the mission. Everyone knows why they're there. Everyone works in teams. And, and that's how our best work is done. Everyone is a data hound. They want more data. Make sure they get it right. And everything we do is part of the ERS brand. You know, a report comes out, that's an ERS report. That's not Joe Smith's report. And so there's a tremendous amount of pride in how folks go about their work. And, and I would just say, you know, ERS is a place where we do a lot of serious work. We have serious people involved there. They're doing serious research on serious questions that are focusing on the well being of American households, farmers, and communities. And so I was you know, pleasantly surprised. Uh, at how, it, how it's going. I thought that I would be bringing, leveraging my career as an academic and scholar to bring that to ERS. Uh, nope, this is a second career. Uh, I'm doing things that are much different. I bring those, everyone brings something different to the table. Uh, that's what I brought to the table, but this is, uh, this has really been a professionally exceptionally satisfying experience. And I look forward to the next few years as well. It's a, a great transition to one of the questions that I think we've asked on, on each of these um, seminars as we've gone through the last few weeks. Um, can you each take a, a few minutes just to talk about your career path? What, what led you to where you are today? You, you both have extensive resumes and um, have done a great deal of, of diverse work. So. I, I'd be curious to hear sort of what those, those paths are. In, in DC, sometimes you have the traditional and you have the, the untraditional. Um, as an example, I started out as a high school English teacher, um, which was of course a natural path to become an ag lobbyist in DC. Um, so I'd be curious if both of you could just take a few minutes and uh, give a little bit of your, your background and, and how, what brought you here. I'll start, I, I'm an ag kid, grew up on a very small uh, livestock and row crop uh, farm on, in Benton County, Mississippi. I wanted to be involved in agriculture. It was a very small farm, very hard work. And uh, so a way for me to be involved uh, was to uh, pursue a career in agriculture. And uh, at Tennessee State University, I was fortunate to have a professor who was a NAS employee. He was recruiting uh, the student, uh, some of the better students from the School of Agriculture and Statistics, et cetera. And uh, I ended up with an internship. 
And uh, I'm a big proponent of internships that allow uh, individuals to take a look uh, within the federal sector. Uh, and uh, so it was uh, something that kept me close uh, to agriculture. And then I just kind of built my career uh, within the organization. I've been, uh, uh, I worked in multiple locations. I started out full-time in, in Louisiana, had a chance to look at Southeastern agriculture, moved to Springfield, Illinois, Illinois uh, to uh, Midwestern agriculture, big corn, soybean, uh, hog state, and then on into headquarters, worked in a variety of positions, data collection branch, uh, livestock branch, uh, moved out to uh, the state of Missouri as the uh, state director uh, for Missouri, uh, very challenging and, and rewarding position. And then back into headquarters, I had a, an opportunity to uh, uh, partake in a number of leadership development programs and, uh, you know, and just kind of made my way uh, through uh, headquarters. Uh, to this point. So I'm uh, very fortunate. Uh, and uh, like I said, I uh, worked my way up through this organization. So, Well, I, I grew up in a small town called Washington, D.C. I was born two blocks west of the White House. It's now the Farragut West Station. I went to a university four blocks west from the, of the White House at George Washington. Um, my parents immigrated to the U.S. and my father, he, well, he was a bad shepherd back home. He'd always come back with fewer animals than he went out with. Uh, but he came and got into the uh, restaurant business in the D.C. area. So I have a food marketing background. I worked there. But I was quite interested in, kind of the, in the cultural changes of societies and how they advance. And that's how I got into anthropology and migrated over to agricultural economics because you know, most of these societies are agriculturally oriented and found I really enjoyed the economics a lot. And, uh, and from there, I, I, took, I went to Maryland and went to uh, get a PhD at, uh, in California. And so uh, when I took my first position, you know, the idea is, okay, what am I going to work on? Um, and uh, I really like working on issues related to production because I think you know, that's where you can really make an impact in farmer. You have tangible data, you have tangible criteria in place and uh, there's profit maximization, cost minimization. And so I just kind of built, built my career kind of focusing on um, being curious. You know, the fo I focused on what I wanted to do, not what I wanted to believe, wanted to be, you know, so, you know, no one ever figures out what life is about, okay, and it doesn't matter, okay, uh, you'll get there, you know, the science guys always talk about, you have to, diff you have to innovate or die, well, you know, from a behavioral point of view, you have to differentiate or die, you know, how do you kind of but how do you create additional value to yourself to what you bring to the table? That's going to be different from others. You know, if there are five of us at the table, we all have the same training, same perspectives for a redundant. And so kind of focus on the value you can bring to the table. And so I kind of organized my career that way. And I was fortunate every five years or so, I had a new set of experiences. I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, if you really want to, during the transition, if you really want to learn how markets work, go to a place where markets don't work. Uh, that's, you know, then you start to see the mechanisms that, that are important, the institutions that are important. Uh, I always had a dynamic perspective uh, that is current decisions influence future possibilities. And uh, my research is focused in that direction. Uh, you know, my personal perspectives are focused in that direction. And so I, uh, you know, I just advanced through the, through the university system in that way. But I always had an interest in trying to deal with contemporary issues, bringing kind of the power of economic thinking to contemporary themes. Uh, and uh, sometimes you think, well, how are you ever going to measure something like the value of corporate social responsibility. Well, you know, if it's important, you can find a way to measure. 
And so those are the kind of challenges I would take on. That's great, thank you. Um, I know this week is an especially busy one at USDA um, as you all are getting ready for the USDA Ag Outlook Forum. And uh, Dr. Stefano, I know you and your team are especially involved in, in this event. Um, so I wanted to give um, both of you a little opportunity just to uh, give a, a sneak peek of maybe the forum in particular, what, what it is and, and what your roles are. Um, and then just additionally to the, um, to the Ag Outlook Forum, for congressional staff that are watching that are new um, to learning about these, how can they learn about additional resources? What are, what's the best way for them to continue their, uh, their learning into your agencies? Well, I'll jump in here first. Um, we have about 13 different folks participating in the Outlook Forum. Actually, I'm personally moderating a session on agricultural productivity. Uh, that'll feature some of the work done at ERS as well as elsewhere. Uh, and looking at how uh, that's a story of growth, productivity. You know, if, if you, if you want to grow, you, know, the, the, you have to start to measure your growth patterns and productivity is about not just how much more output you get, but it's output relative to resources that go in. Uh, we're going to be having sessions on uh, food price outlook. Uh, drought risk, uh, farm income uh, sector and wealth forecasting, uh, soil health practices, and some of these outlook uh, sessions related to the commodities. Uh, we even have something on drought driven, uh, data driven insights into uh, food insecurity. And so you'll see a lot of different economic themes related to the broad characterization of agriculture. We also have a booth, an exhibition booth. These are pretty cool. You can pop in there to look at uh, look at some of the resources we'll have available for folks to uh, to engage in. Uh, some of our recent reports. Uh, some of the leadership will be in there. I'll be in there a couple of times over the course of the two days, and you'll find a pretty you'll find that to be a pretty engaging place to to interact. Uh, it's kind of like the virtual ex exhibition hall. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. And tomorrow will be the official release of a mobile app for Charts of Note. I don't know if folks have, have discovered the ERS Charts of Note. They're kind of little bite-sized nuggets of something going on uh, from a, a recent report. Uh, it's just one chart and a brief description. And so it's available in the Apple Store and on the Google Play Store for Android. And of course you can you can sign up and get it every day. Probably Janae gets it every day in her inbox. And if she doesn't, she should. And I'll just mention a couple of items in support of the Outlook Forum. Uh, again, who's who in agriculture. Uh, when that uh, function was held in person, uh, NAS will also have a virtual booth uh, with some of our products and, and staff manning that. That also I'll be personally participating in a session with some scholars uh, from around the country, uh, talking to them about their career aspirations, opportunities at USDA. And in addition to that, we have a session on data and, and data visualization tools uh, that we know uh, the uh, participants will enjoy participating in as well. So I uh, hope that we have a very large turnout generally but, uh, in person. It was about 2,000 individuals. And I know that through that virtual uh, environment, it's much, much larger uh, over the last year or so. Thank you. I, I know as a former congressional staffer, uh, the amount of information and, and resources that you all have can be a little intimidating. So it's great to hear about how to, how to access it. And I uh, look forward to downloading the, the ERS app in particular. Um, the chat box has been a little quiet, but I do have a question that came through that I wanted to put out. Um, we have just a few minutes left before we wrap up here. Um, farm income has been high, but you also track how much of the food dollar goes to farmers. With inflation over the past six months, have you seen an increase or decrease in how much of the food dollar goes to the farmer? Uh, well, we just, well, we're tracking the food dollar. We have to update it because the food price inflation numbers we're talking about you know, are just in the last couple of months. Uh, how much goes to the farmer is, we track that over time. 
and it's been fairly constant, you know, wh where you know, the food dollar reflects the whole chain. And the chain is a pretty interesting, pretty interesting place. Uh, you know, naively we think they're farmers and consumers. No, there are lots of folks in between. No, no one consumes what a farmer produces. It's massaged, it's polished, it's, it's transformed into lots of different products. And even you know, from the processor point of view, there's still a few new players in between processors and, and final end users, consumers. And so uh, how, you know, all these folks add value to the product. I mean, yes, the farmer gets a small share, fairly small share, like on the order of 10% or so. Uh, but uh, there are lots of folks that are in that system that add value. And you know, this is a system that is probably the largest in terms of employment in the US economy. You know, we want to look at the impact of, of the ag, of agriculture in the US economy. It's just not the value farmers produce, but it's also the transformation and other opportunities that are there. And as such, you know, it's probably the, one of the biggest single parts of the U.S. economy. Um, and it's not something that's going to get offshored very easily. It's kind of hard to offshore your food manufacturing and bring it and bring in it back in. So, you know, those, those are some of the challenges that we face in looking at the system. And of course, the supply chain discussions are, you know, top of mind for everyone right now. Uh, we look at, you know, how the supply chain has been disrupted by the pandemic. Uh, and it kind of hopefully you know, brings some more, more focus on, you know, this is the complexity of the system that we have and, uh, and the value that it adds and how we need to start thinking of creating off-ramps to make it a little bit more flexible. Thank you. Anything to add, Administrator Hamer? No, I think uh, that one's more in Spiro's court. Great. So I have one final question before we um, look to close up this, this great session. Uh, and I recognize that you are not going to provide any recommendations to Congress or anything of that nature, um, as we've discussed. But uh, we do have congressional staff um, watching in particular that uh, are going to be facing some important pieces of legislation in the, in the upcoming um, days and years in particular. Of note, of course, the, uh, the next farm bill uh, that's going to be under consideration to, to be reauthorized. Um, so I wanted to give you both an opportunity to talk about what are the key challenges of, of everything that we've talked about today and maybe maybe some areas that we haven't talked about. What are the key challenges that you see ahead that um, could potentially need additional focus in the next few years or maybe even the next decade? Well, well I'll mention that again, the insatiable appetite for information and data. Important decisions will be made uh, and uh, as we prepare for the next farm, always preparing for another farm bill, uh, uh, our data, uh, the data that NASP has, the data that ERS has, uh, is going to be used in that process. And, uh, you know, our resources are very tight and uh, we do the best that we can with those, with those dollars to try to make sure that we have the most uh, complete and sound information uh, that we can provide. Uh, to uh, support those evidence-based uh, decisions and uh, the decision makers. And uh, we appreciate the relationship that we have uh, with the congressional uh, members. And uh, uh, we uh, are here to provide those services when, and hopefully uh, the data are, are, are used uh, to, for those purposes. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and I'll, I'll hop on that bandwagon as well. You know, data, Data are crucial for us to add value to policymakers and their decision making. Uh, you, you want us, you know, if you want us to go into some of these more subtle areas that relate to racial social equity, you know, the only way we can really study that carefully is getting the data. And sometimes that involves different kinds of data, different searches for data different intensity of data collection. We want, to look, we want to look at nutritional insecurity. 
where are the data that we're going to do. And we buy data, we buy privately, privately provided data to augment with the publicly available data to try to add value to the whole system. But you know, data are what's going to make it work and add value. And, and then the federal government, we're also revisioning the federal statistical system in terms of how folks can access data and making it more transparent in how they can access the data. And that's gonna take more resources on our part to make sure that we can curate the data and make it accessible to folks and maybe even make more data available than, uh, than are currently available. Uh, to, to the whole community, not just researchers, but other parts of the federal government to share data across. So that's, uh, that tends to be one of our, our biggest sticking points. It's, uh, those resources are, are highly, highly valued by us. So anything we can do to add more would be, would be certainly welcome. Well, thank you. And uh, I want to thank you both uh, again for participating in, in this session today. Um, to, to wrap up, I just wanted to say that the audience has been able to learn just a fraction of the, the work that NAS and ERS and the broader REE mission do to, to serve U.S. agriculture and those that rely on it. Um, NCFAR has been a proud advocate for continued federal support of the work of this agency um, and those data needs that you just mentioned. Um, for the audience, if you missed any of the previous sessions or are interested in learning more, uh, make sure you go to ncfar.org where you can find recorded sessions featuring this and previous webinars. Um, so thank you again to everyone for your participation today. And with that, we will conclude this session. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Take care.